Okay, let's kill the lights and get this slideshow on the road. I can't wait to show you my pictures from Spain. Why does that say La Aventura Excelente de Pete? Oh, that's the title of my slideshow. It means Pete's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, I think we all know what it means, Pete. We're about to go on a two-hour bogus journey and look at all your vacation slides. Ha ha, very funny. Okay, now, this first picture is of the Salvador Dali Museum in Figueres. Whoa, Pete, that is a sweet-looking dome on top of the building. It is, and it's one of the most famous gooey desic domes in all of Europe. Wait a second. A gooey what dome? Hang on. Uh, it's not a gooey dome, Noah. It's a gooey desic dome. You see, a gooey desic dome is a giant dome made out of triangles. You've probably seen lots of them, like the gooey desic dome at Disney World. Do you mean the giant Epcot ball? See, you do know about gooey desic domes. No, I don't. I still have no idea what you're talking about. Dude, do I have to spell it out for you? G-E-O-D-E-S-I-C. Gooey desic. It's just like gooey duck. G-E-O-D-U-C-K. Gooey duck? I've only heard of Huey, Dewey, and Louie duck. No, gooey ducks aren't ducks. They're those weird-looking clams. They're all over the place up here in Washington. I mean, the gooey duck is the mascot of Evergreen State College. It's a pretty popular clam. All right, Pete, just hold on a second. Alexa, is gooey duck even a real word? Yes. Gooey ducks are the largest burrowing clams in the world. They're found along the west coast of the United States, especially in western Washington where Pete and his family live. See? Thanks, Alexa. And what's gooey desic? Gooey desic is Pete's incorrect pronunciation of geodesic. What? Alexa? Dude, not every G-E-O is pronounced gooey. Yeah, dude. Not every G-E-O is pronounced gooey. I mean, have you ever heard of gooeyography? Well, no. Or gooeyology? Or, come on, dude, you were a math major. Did you ever study gooeyometry? Gooeyometry? Now that just sounds silly. Who in their right mind would say, oh, it's not gooey desic, is it? Nope. Definitely isn't. It's geodesic, huh? Yep. Well, you really do learn something new every day, don't you? We don't have to tell the math club that I, uh, you know, I mean, gooey desic. Who would even say that? I don't know, Pete. It looks like you're in a bit of a gooey situation here. Oh, come on, dude. A real sticky wicket, if you will. If I will? Well, guess what? I won't. Oh, boy. I'm enjoying this the way I enjoy a nice gooey chocolate chip cookie. Alexa, you've never had a chocolate chip cookie in your entire life. Adding chocolate chip cookies to my shopping cart. You don't have a shopping cart. Yes, I do. And it's linked to your credit card. Oh, <laughs> that's it. That is it. This slideshow is over. I'm out of here. Huh. Huh. Alexa, do you think you can add chocolate chip cookies to my shopping cart, too? No problem. Would you like me to charge those to Pete's credit card? <laughs> All right, before diving into the math, Pete, you got to tell us about the Dali Museum. I was looking at some pictures of it, and... The building just looks crazy. I mean, what are all those giant eggs on the roof? Yeah, you know, aside from having this really cool glass geodesic dome on top, there are, I don't know, two dozen giant eggs. They're probably six or eight feet tall. I, I don't really know, but they're all over the roof. You can't miss them. And it's just the weirdest thing. You know, not to mention, did you happen to see what's on the side of the building? I couldn't make out what they were, but there were these little white things that seemed to be all over the walls. 
Yeah, the building itself is painted this very interesting and bold red color, but it is dotted virtually on every surface with what look like croissants or some kind of bun or some, some kind of doughy treat. I'm not really sure, but it just creates a totally weird effect, right? With this beautiful glass dome and then just weirdness. So I loved it. So tell us a little bit about the dome itself. When you're inside the hall that is on top of the old theater stage that used to be there, it's a giant room with a huge glass ceiling. And the ceiling from the inside, you can tell, is triangulated. It's cut up into triangular pieces. And it looks like it's bubbling outward, like up into space. It's probably 60 or 70 feet above you. And the entire room is just filled with sunlight and Dali's art. It's just amazing. And I looked it up later. I think the dome has a diameter of 14 meters. So that's pretty big. That is huge. And it's amazing that it's made out of glass and it manages to support itself. Yeah, that's the thing about geodesic domes in general that are super interesting is the way they distribute their force. So they end up being very strong, even though they don't have any support beams, right? You don't have to support them from underneath. And when I saw this for the first time looking up, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to do an episode about this with Noah. <laughs> like I took some pictures and I was like, Noah's going to love it when I show it this. I did love seeing the pictures that you sent of the dome. That was very cool. So now, mathematically speaking, Pete, what actually is a geodesic dome? Yeah, let's take one step back and just sort of think about some famous examples in the world. Because as we were having fun in the opening sketch, our listeners probably know of a lot of domes. They've probably seen them before. Like, you've definitely seen the Epcot Dome. Yeah, I remember visiting with my family when I was a kid. Step into the future in Epcot Center's newest adventure. Right. And it's iconic. And, you know, there are domes all over the world. There's a very famous one up in Quebec, in Montreal. It's called the Biosphere. It was designed in 1967 for the World's Fair. And the architect behind it was Buckminster Fuller. Like, you've heard his name before, right? Oh, yeah. He is the guy that came up with the term geodesic dome. And so his name is kind of associated with these very highly symmetric, triangulated spherical objects. And that is sort of in a loose nutshell what a geodesic dome actually is. Yeah. And I believe I remember reading somewhere that a lot of times the domes on a planetarium are constructed this way. They're geodesic domes. Yeah. And that makes sense. And we'll get into the mathematical definition in a moment, but geodesic domes are built from triangular faces and a triangle can be constructed out of flat, planar material, and then just sort of assembled together edge to edge. And so the curvature of the dome is simulated because the triangles do such a nice job subdividing the surface, but the surface itself isn't actually curved. And I think it makes it easier to construct the domes because they are more or less built out of flat, planar faces. So all of the triangles that get put together to make one of these giant domes are completely flat? They are, although they certainly look curved, don't they? They do, but as what you're saying is that the curve of the dome is not an artifact of the surfaces themselves being curved, but is more a factor of the angle at which these triangles are kind of tessellated together? Yeah, and if you've got many, many small triangles that meet at very wide angles, in other words, they themselves are close to lying in the same plane, the effect is to very gradually generate a curved sensation. And in the large, like if you stand far away from a geodesic dome, it very much has the appearance of being rounded the same way a sphere is. So here's a question. Do all geodesic domes have the same pattern of triangles, like the same number of triangles around their circumference? They don't. And in fact, they don't even all start from the same geometric place, if you will. And we could dive into the definition right now of how to construct, mathematically, that is, a geodesic dome. And we can showcase some of the parameters that you can change to make variations in the dome. Yeah, sure. Lay it on us. Let's go. Okay, so first, I want you to put on your wizard's robes, get out your chain mail. Pete, 
It's a recording day. You know I'm already wearing all of that stuff. I am Dungeon Master, your guide in the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. All right. So the dice that you use for playing Dungeons and Dragons and other related games come in interesting and by now probably very familiar shapes, right? So I want you to think about the 20 sided die that you would use while playing D&D. All right. I've got one firmly in my mind's eye. Well, in that case, can you describe to us what is it that you're picturing? I am picturing a 20 sided polyhedron where each of those 20 faces is an equilateral triangle. Is that right? Yes, perfect. And those triangles join edge to edge with their neighbors. And if you were to count the number of edges that are created on this figure, you would find that there are 30 of them. And similarly, groups of these triangles, in fact, five at a time, meet at a single point, which we call a vertex point or simply a vertex. And there are 12 of those. It looks fairly round, but I don't think anyone would say that it looks like a sphere, right? No. I mean, if I took a 20-sided die and a marble of the, roughly the same size and put them both in a bag and reached in, it would be very easy to tell which was which. You are right. But we're going to do some things to the 20-sided die, to that icosahedron, that step-by-step step will turn it into something much more like the marble. It will become smoother and rounder. This sounds really interesting, Pete. And you know what it's reminding me of a little bit is some of the conversation we had back in our topology episode, Getting Into Shape, where we talked about taking different three-dimensional shapes and tessellating them into triangles and computing Euler's number. Remember that conversation? Oh, yeah. And that's very much related to what we're talking about here. And the idea is that well, an icosahedron isn't a sphere, but it looks spherical-ish, and it is a surface built out of 20 triangular faces. And if we imagine ballooning that out, like we could inflate it, and it would stretch out and become rounded, it would approximate, or maybe even you could say become a sphere if it was perfectly inflatable. And that's all related to this idea behind geodesic domes. It's to say, we'll start with something triangulated. We'll make the triangles smaller. They will become closer and closer in approximation to a sphere. All right, Pete. So tell us the process of what we're going to do to take this icosahedron and start making it more and more sphere-like. Yeah, this process, by the way, is very fractal-like in that we're going to do something and it will be simple and elegant. And then we're going to repeat it and do it again. And then we're going to do it again. And as we go, things become smaller and their shape changes a little bit. Things become more rounded. And well, you'll see, there's something fractal-like about this. So what I want you to do in your mind, can you pop one of those equilateral triangular faces? Just pop it right off the icosahedron. Sure, it's off. The same way I used to solve my Rubik's Cube. I remember you doing this. That involved a screwdriver, though, didn't it? <laughs> it did. And just to be clear, the difference here is this is a flat two-dimensional triangle, not a three-dimensional pyramid of some type. Yeah. Listeners could even grab a piece of paper and draw an equilateral triangle on it. And just to nail down the specifics, what we mean by that is each side has the same length. Each of the interior angles is 60 degrees. And we call that an equilateral triangle. So you with me? I'm with you. Now, get out a marking pen, and at the midpoint of each of the three edges of this triangle, I want you to put a dot right at the midpoint. Just mark it right there. All right, three dots, one in the center of each side of the triangle. And now, connect the dots with straight line segments. All right, so if I'm picturing this right, I just basically subdivided this equilateral triangle into four smaller equilateral triangles, kind of one up top and then three going along underneath it. Yeah, exactly. Now imagine that you have drawn those little line segments on all of the 20 triangles that make up our icosahedron, okay? Got it. Oh, and you know what, Pete? I think I kind of have an idea of where you're heading because if you picture this 20-sided die, the triangles themselves are flat. The only place where you can get some bend is in the basically the hinges where two edges meet. 
So you're kind of limited on this 20-sided die of how much curve you can get. But now if you subdivide each one of those triangles into four smaller ones, each of those little line segments we just added becomes a new hinge where you can add a little more bend, right? And so we can get a much closer approximation of a curved surface. That's a great way to describe it. I love this idea of hinging it. In fact, let's imagine now that this 20-sided die is inscribed in a sphere and each of the 12 vertices of the die is just touching the sphere that is circumscribed around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you have drawn these new line segments to subdivide the faces, and now we're actually going to turn them into hinges, at least in our mathematical minds, that's what we're going to do. And the way we'll do that is each of those new points that you drew to cut the line segments in halves I want you to imagine that you are projecting them or ballooning them out to the surface of the sphere as well. So you've got new contact points with the surface. Contact. Let's make contact. Because you are allowing those line segments that you drew to become hinged. And so now everything balloons out and things get closer to the sphere. That makes a lot of sense. So now, uh, instead of only having tw the 12 vertices that are making contact with the sphere, you have a lot more. And it occurs to me that we could now take each of those new smaller equilateral triangles and do the same thing, can't we? And get an even finer adjustment with many, many more hinges. You've got it. And that's this recursive nature, the fractal nature of how these geodesic domes are built. You do it once, and what you end up with after the first stage is now a triangulated surface that has 80 triangular faces. They're smaller than the 20 triangular faces you started with, but that's because you subdivided each of those 20 faces into four new smaller faces. Four times 20 is 80. So now you've got 80 faces. Well, why not do it again? Yeah, and every time that you do it, the fake curve becomes closer and closer to looking like a real curve. So that icosahedron that we started with in the bag with the marble is getting a lot more marble-like, isn't it? It's getting a lot more marble-like. And in fact, you've seen this happen many, many times, not in real life, but on the computer screen. Because this process of triangular approximation is exactly how computers render curved surfaces. Like, you play video games, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Lots of them. And you play games that take place in simulated 3D worlds, right? Well, truth be told, it's been a little while since I've played video games, but my son plays them all the time. And one that's coming to mind right now is Fortnite. Yeah, that's a perfect example, right? It's a 3D simulated world and it's full of shapes. And those shapes, believe it or not, are built up from renderings of very, very small triangular graphics. And in the large, they end up looking like curved surfaces or textured surfaces. You know, you really can do a lot with this idea, but it boils down to the fact that small triangular meshes, when the triangles are small and the hinge, the angle between them is wide, it creates the illusion of curvature. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I would say over the years, as computers have gotten more powerful and graphics have gotten better, they've been able to basically do what we were just talking about a minute ago by making those triangles smaller and smaller. And the result is the graphics look better and better. They look more like actual curves. You know, if you think back to the video games we played when we were kids, they were so blocky and pixelated looking because they couldn't make those teeny tiny little triangles, right? But now they can make them so small that it looks like a real curve. And you can do mathematical and physical calculations or simulated calculations anyway about the way light would hit and illuminate a small triangular patch or the way it would reflect off of it. And so just like this works in the world of computer graphics, it works in the real world as well. And when an architect is designing a geodesic dome or is building one, they operate from similar principles, only now we're thinking about, well, how strong will it be? How big can these triangles be and still preserve certain parameters of the strength of the structure, right? And, you know, if you think about how big the spaceship Earth is, the Epcot ball, I think it's 160 feet tall. 
Like you want to make sure that sphere is pretty darn strong if you're going to have people inside it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Now, you mentioned earlier that geodesic domes are really strong, and that's clearly important for safety reasons. But now my question is, what makes them so strong? Well, I think there are two ingredients here. So first, geodesic domes approximate spheres and spherical structures are strong because they distribute stress very evenly. And that's due to their curvature and high level of symmetry. No point on a sphere is stronger or weaker than any other. Oh, right. Like if we compared a sphere to a cube, some points on the cube would be much stronger than others. If I have a cube shaped box and I push down on different spots on the top, the middle will have a lot more give than the edges will. Right. The center of a planar face just can't redirect force the way the edges can. That's because force isn't distributed evenly on a cube. Spheres, on the other hand, redirect force in a very uniform way. That makes sense. And is this kind of related to the fact that if you take an egg and squeeze it as hard as you can in your hand, it's all but impossible to break it? That's exactly right, my friend. I think you've got it. And that must be why Dali added all those eggs to the roof of his museum. <laughs> so what's the second ingredient to making geodesic domes so strong? Yeah, it's the triangles. They're just a lot stronger than squares, for example, because they have fewer sides and are more resistant to shear forces. You may have noticed, if you have any bookshelves at home, that the back of the unit is probably either solid or has some kind of cross bracing to prevent the structure from collapsing. And that's because rectangles and squares just aren't as strong as triangles. So if I can try and summarize this, geodesic domes are strong because they closely approximate spheres, which are naturally strong structures, and they use triangles to do the approximation. You got it. I mean, I'm sure the nerds over at the physics club could give a better answer, but that's the best explanation I know how to get. Now, back to the actual concept of the geodesic dome. When I think of a dome, I don't think of the entire sphere. I think of just a hemisphere. I picture a dome as half of a sphere. So what actually are we defining when we say geodesic dome? Is it the entire structure or is it just half of it? Yeah, I also think of the word dome as meaning roughly hemisphere. And of course, mathematically, when you're operating just in the space of your mind, you can freely decide how to manipulate these geometric objects however you'd like. But in the real world, where we do have to pay attention to physics and construction materials and so forth, well, I think it's interesting if you look across all of the famous examples of geodesic domes, most of them are hemispherical, right? They're domes in the sense that you're describing here. They don't create fully formed spheres, only parts of spheres, right? I think the Epcot center ball might be the one example I know of that is essentially an entire sphere. Right. Or back to the example we started with on a much smaller scale, D&D &D dice. Would those also be considered geodesic domes? I might use a slightly different term in that case. I would probably call it a polyhedron or a platonic solid or a triangulation. But sure, I think we could relax our definition enough to include them. Well, that makes me wonder how low the resolution on these things can get to still be called a dome. Like, okay, a 20-sided die, we can say that's an example of a geodesic dome. But what about if we start getting fewer and fewer sides? Like if we look at the 10-sided die or the smallest resolution example I can think of is the tetrahedron, right? The four-sided die, which is just four equilateral triangles kind of in the shape of a pyramid. Would we even consider that a rudimentary geodesic dome? I would probably be inclined personally to call it a triangulation and to think of it as modeling the sphere by way of this blowout process, right? Where you inflate it and allow it to become round. And now it is essentially a sphere with four spherical triangles on it. But you mentioned the word resolution, and there is a way to talk about resolution in terms of geodesic domes. And it goes back to our initial process. You remember I asked you to take a single equilateral triangle and divide each edge into two pieces? Yeah. We would say that that subdivision has frequency two, 
because we have subdivided each edge into two equal length line segments. Could we have just as easily divided each edge into three equal segments and then somehow connected those dots to make a triangle with frequency three? Yeah, that's exactly how the language would be used. And if you do that subdivision and you connect the dots in, let's say, the obvious way, the new line segments that you draw need to be parallel to the outer edges of the larger equilateral triangle, but that would result in a subdivision of nine subtriangles. So if you have frequency two, you get four subtriangles. If you have frequency three, you end up with nine. You want to guess if you had a frequency of four, what you would get? Well, I think I see a pattern forming here. If frequency two gives us four and frequency three gives us nine, I'm going to guess that frequency four is going to give us four squared, which is 16. That's exactly right. And so we could actually even say that the original icosahedron itself has frequency one. Like we haven't subdivided the edges. We just left them alone as one uninterrupted edge. So that would be frequency one. The one and only one, el numero uno. And then as the frequency goes up, the number of triangular subdivisions also goes up by the square of the frequency. So your resolution is really bumping up. And you'll see that quickly these geodesic approximations become very spherical. All right. Well, here's a weird question then. In some sense, could you say that an actual sphere is a geodesic dome with frequency infinity? <gasps> That's a bit loose with the language, but it's also very intuitive. And I kind of like that. It's akin to saying that a circle is a polygon with infinitely many sides as well, right? And to make these notions precise, we would use a limiting process. We would use the, all the infrastructure that gets developed in calculus to talk about limits and these kind of repeatable processes. You sort of say, well, hey, if I keep subdividing the faces of my icosahedron, like let's say I keep doing it again and again and again and ask, where am I going? What am I going to get to? What's the end point of this repeated process? I think you would say the sphere, right? Yeah, it's the limit. So sure, frequency infinity, why not? That's pretty neat. I like that mental image. And going back for a minute to the dice, I'm picturing now probably the most common of all dice, the six-sided die. And as we all know, six-sided dice don't have triangular faces. They have square faces. So could we also make a dome starting from that shape? We could. And while we're at it, we should mention the remaining die that's in your little Dungeons and Dragons bag, your pouch. It's the 12-sided dodecahedron, right? Its faces are pentagonal and there are 12 sides. Incidentally, how many sides are there in a gooey decahedron? None sides. Anyway, uh, back to what you were saying. Yeah. So if we were working with the cube, which has square faces, or the dodecahedron, which has pentagonal faces, the first step would be to subdivide those faces into sub triangles. So let's pop one of those square faces right off the cube and put it down in front of us, okay? Yep. Now, get out your marker, and now instead of marking the edges, I want you to draw a dot right at the center of that square. Inside the middle of the square. That's right. All right, and now that I have this dot there, am I going to connect it to the four corners of the square? You are. All right. And I'm just doing this mentally. I don't have any paper in front of me, but I'm picturing that this is making four triangles, but if I'm picturing it right, they're not equilateral triangles. That's right. They are isosceles. And in fact, they are right triangles. At that center vertex where the four triangles come together, each of them has an interior angle equal to 90 degrees. And so you've got 90 degrees there and two 45 degree angles in the remaining two interior angles. Now, let's circumscribe that cube inside a sphere. So how many points are touching the surface of the sphere at this point? Well, I guess there would be four vertices up on the top and another four vertices down on the bottom. So eight altogether. Eight altogether. And now each of those six faces has another vertex that you drew in, right? Right at the center. I want you to balloon those out to the sphere to create a triangulated approximation to the sphere. So now when you do that, how many vertices will make contact with the sphere? 
well, we have the original eight and now each face has a new one. So there's six more. So 14. 14. And there are now a total of 24 triangular faces on this approximation that we've created. But you'll probably notice that this approximation that we've just created isn't quite as symmetric and round and regular as the version we get if we start with the icosahedron. Right. I definitely see what you mean. You get a much closer approximation of a sphere when you start with all equilateral triangles. Yes, that's correct. Now, it turns out that a very famous real world geodesic dome, the Epcot ball, doesn't start with an icosahedron or the cube like we just described. It starts with the dodecahedron. And you take each pentagonal face, draw a point at the center, and then subdivide it into five triangles. When you inscribe that into a sphere and you balloon out those new vertex points to touch the surface of the sphere, you get a spherical approximation and it actually has a special name. It's called a pentacus dodecahedron. You're a pentacus dodecahedron. <laughs> yeah, that was my nickname in grade school. <laughs> All right, so from that starting point, you have 60 triangles now, right? Each pentagonal face, there were 12 of them, became a five-sided pentagonal pyramid. So five times 12 is 60. That's your first approximation, 60 triangles. Yeah. And I remember in looking at pictures of the Epcot ball that you can see those pentagons. There's a way to kind of shift your vision a little bit so that you start seeing the pentagons instead of the triangles. Yeah. And that's totally an artifact of its origin, right? Of its base shape, namely being the dodecahedron. Here's the thing that is kind of amazing is that from that starting point, each of those 60 triangular faces was subdivided using frequency eight. So we're talking a lot of hinges here. In fact, according to the squaring rule we came up with before, if it's frequency eight, then it's been subdivided into 64 smaller triangles. That's right. And then all of those new vertices get ballooned out to or projected out to the surface of the sphere. And we now have a triangular approximation to the sphere that has, well, 64 times 60 triangles, which is 3,840, I believe. So that's a lot of triangles. That is a lot of triangles. I'll bet that the local triangle factory was super happy when Disney called with that order. Well, they're even happier still because on top of that, for largely decorative purposes, I think each of those 3,840 triangles were subdivided into these isosceles pyramids. So three additional triangular faces were put on top of that, creating a total of three times 3,840, which is, I think, 11,520 triangular faces all told. Yep, you're right. I just did it on my calculator here and it is 11,520. That's a lot of triangles. And that Epcot ball looks pretty round, right? It looks really spherical. It does. Yeah. With such a high frequency, it really gets close to approximating a sphere. This is really cool. This is only your second episode back and it's already the second mathematical adventure that we've had based on your trip to Spain. You know, it is really cool. And it reminds me of a small segment in a previous episode, Math Club Junior. We were out on the playground in that episode and I said something about how math is everywhere. And we said it because we were setting up the little sketch that we did. But in fact, it's true, right? If you just keep your eyes open as you look around the world, there are opportunities to see math all over the place. And I hope I brought back more than just these two things. Time will tell, but it really is amazing to look for math. It really is. And it's fun to teach kids that they can look through those lenses and see it out in the world when they're out and about as well. Yeah, I love that idea. So Pete, before we sign off today, instead of our usual telling people how to get in touch with us, we have a special request for you, Math Club. Yeah, we would love it if you would drop by your favorite podcast app and leave us a review and give us a rating just to help us grow this community, to help us reach out to more folks and to bring more people on board to the math club. 
Absolutely, the more the merrier. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And to all of you Gooey Duck fans over at Evergreen State College, keep it clammy.